Welcome to Internet TCI, our monthly program where we explore the global internet. My name is Rich Wiggins, and I'm speaking to you tonight from East Lansing, Michigan. I'd like to introduce my partner in crime, Chuck Severance. Thanks, Rich. We have a really neat show planned for you tonight in our uh, Internet for Everyone segment. Rich is going to talk about some more of the traditional and older forms of communication on the internet, sort of the basic email and the Usenet news and the other forms of communication that have been around for many years. Uh, we're going to see Rich's first on the road segment. He's going to the Café Electronique in Montreal, Canada, and I'm looking forward to that a lot. Uh, I'm going to do Tech Talk, and we're going to actually talk about what's in the studio and what we use for doing the show. I'm looking forward to that. We'll do our Net News segment, where we sort of come up with what's going on in the news that's related to the internet. Our internet interview, also done by Rich this time, is with Vern Ehlers, who's a congressman from, uh, from Grand Rapids, and that that's, looks like a really good interview, and always we're going to do uh, network surfing. So Rich, uh, what have you run across this month that you find interesting and exciting you want to share with all of us? Well, Chuck, as, as you know, I've written several times for a magazine called Internet World Magazine, and mm -hmm. I had occasion recently to finally go and look at their online World Wide Web archive of back issues. The reason why I needed to look it up, look things up, is um, I hadn't billed them for some articles I'd written, and I didn't know which months I'd written what article. But there's something you're going to forget. That's the one thing. Well, that's me. I'm right. the only person I know that would forget to bill somebody <laughs> for something. So I went and found the uh, archive, and um, so shall we? Uh, yeah, sure. So your hot site tonight today is uh, Internet World. Yeah. So when did you run across this? Let's take well, a look. about a week ago. So let's click on the back, back issues. issues. Crunch, okay. crunch, crunch. Load, load, load. So this is the February issue? Mm-hmm. Not surprisingly, because we're pulling down all these covers, it takes a little while to get it over the net. And if you think about it, this can actually be useful, um, because not just you're wanting to bill for a back issue that you've written for, but as a consumer of this magazine, if you don't keep a good archive yourself, well, the longer they keep this net-based archive of, of back issues, the more useful it becomes, because you right. want to find out, well, when was Netscape version whatever announced? You can go back and read about it online. Kind of makes it hard to put old, uh, fancy old articles on your uh, magazines on your coffee table, though. You have well, to have a computer you screen on your coffee table. Put Netscape point. on your coffee table. Yeah. So if you want, let's uh, visit the bookshelf here. So. And they've reviewed a whole bunch of books here. Oh. And we go down the list and... Shameless, I shameless self-promotion. interviewed. They, they've how reviewed pick, the internet for we, everyone. How do we pick that one out of all those books? It just uh, randomly. That's pretty amazing. So did they like it? Yeah, they actually liked it. Let's search. Let's see if I'm in this one. If you spell your name right, you're not going to find it. That's good enough. They misspelled hey, your name. They mentioned me. They mentioned me. Chapter. There we go. So it's promoting you as well. But so let's go back one more. Is that all you got paid for? Well, or is well, there more? keep going down. And there's an article on using Netscape and other browsers for business applications. Now, do they put the whole uh, magazine on? Yeah, they wait a month, and then they put the full text of the magazine online. Do they, I'm surprised they don't have ads in here. I am, too. Yeah, that's... Maybe you know, they will at some point. Yeah. Well, my, uh, my favorite site this month uh, <clears throat> is the Wall Street Journal. And uh, the Wall Street Journal has this thing they call AdNet. And it's really exciting to me. We'd seen this a couple of months ago. People, they were asking people who'd be interested in it, and I, I said, oh, that's just another website. But as I began to surf this uh, Wall Street Journal site, it really struck me just how serious these advertisers were. This sort of wasn't, hi, and here's my 800 number. These people are doing some real serious advertising. So my hot site for the month is the Wall Street Journal and their ad net. It's very exciting to me. <clears throat> and the, just the list of companies is very impressive. So we'll take a look at the companies by alphabetical order. And uh, take a bit to download this. Uh, but, but again, this is, a, this is a very exciting thing to me because these people are a, a list of the who's who of uh, internet advertisers. So Alamo Renicar, Apple Computer, AT&T Telecommunications. A couple of months ago, I read in the Chicago Tribune that we'll have a million businesses up on the internet by the end of the year. I don't know whether I believe that claim or not, um, but this one page isn't going to hold a million. And we're items. still we're still downloading this page. Um, let's just impressive. take a look at uh, Alamo Rental Car. 
And it's it just is impressive to me just how many organizations are here and how seriously they take the uh, the internet for their advertising. So here we go. Take us a moment to download this. We're going this. to freeways.com. Yes. Yes. Now apparently we don't get unlimited mileage because it's taking us a while here to download. Here we go. I don't know, Charles. I think the on-ramp may be closed. Well, we'll give this another. Let's go to J.P. Morgan. This is why the stop button is so useful. There we go. Our apologies to Alamo Rental Car. We don't know why your server wasn't responding. It was nothing personal. Yeah. So here's J.P. Morgan. And I just, I, I just found it so impressive that all these organizations uh, have signed up. And it, it's sort of the start of a very, very serious commercial advertising. Yep. So, Rich, what else has happened to you in the last month or so that you want to share? Well, I've gotten some correspondence recently that I want to tell you about. First off, and I don't know if we can capture this on camera or not. I'll hold it up and we'll see if we can get it. I got a letter from somebody on death row. And this person has been reading about the Internet um, in various magazines and newspapers. And he's asking me to help him form a 501c3 um, nonprofit organization to promote a particular kind of thing he's up to. And I don't have any skills in that particular area, so I'm really not going to be able to help him. But what's interesting is he asks me to um, post onto the net a particular solicitation, providing as much exposure as possible without spamming. So he understands some of the lingo of the right. Internet. Right. He's never seen the Internet. He's never seen email. He's never seen Usenet. But he wants That's me prison. or some other author that he gets hold of to help him out with the Internet. Right. Another letter that I got came from Cuba. And this is a student in a university in Cuba um, getting to us over a very circuitous uh, worldwide route. They don't really have direct internet connectivity there, but they're hoping to get connectivity at some point. And somewhere online, perhaps at Internet World, he's seen a review of my book, and he's hoping that I will send him a copy of my book for free um, because uh, they don't have any money right now in Cuba. The, the economy's in terrible shape. Um, I don't know what the position of the U.S. government is in terms of... Uh, Number one, giving books to people in Cuba. But I think if we can get them on the Internet and get them connected, that's all to the good if we want to open things up in Cuba. Right. Two more letters to tell you about. Okay. As you know, President Clinton spoke on campus in spring. I uh, provided a copy of my book through uh, the university along with some other gifts that were given to him. Got a very nice letter from the White House um, with a, a nice uh, paper backing or cardboard backing so it would be uh, preserved well. This is a copy of the letter. The real thing has been squirreled away somewhere. But just to show that Internet TCI is a nonpartisan program, I've also recently received a letter from Governor Engler thanking me for the copy of the book that I sent to him. So Good. Um, just shamelessly giving the book away to every politician I can think of. That's good. That's also good. Uh, what have I mean, you been I, doing I, in terms of personal promotion, well, Charles? I, think it's, I, I do think it's important that uh, people in uh, powerful positions like politicians get a sense of what this stuff is all about. And I think that's really important. Um, well, my show and tell for this week is something that I'm very, very proud of and I've worked a long time to get. Uh, this is the IEEE Computer Magazine, and I'm a member of the IEEE POSIX Standards Organization. I've been working at doing that for five years or so. And uh, last month, my column, I'll have a monthly column in IEEE Computer all about standards, and uh, has my picture here. It's a oh. monthly column. So I'm very... Your uh, picture, Grace, is, is that going to be in there every time or just in the first no, one? No, picture's only going to be there in the oh, first one. Probably. But the, but the theme, theme is that uh, it's the same picture as is on my web page. So it's sort of all all. That's ties what together. it had to do with the Internet. I knew there was something Yeah, to it's do the same the picture. Oh, my URL's in there and everything. And I have guidelines for uh, authors on the web and, and things like that. So. so can you think of anything else before we dive into Internet for everyone? No, let's, let's get surfing. Okay, good. In Internet for Everyone, Rich is going to tell us about the difference between publishing and communication using the Internet. Go ahead, Rich. Thanks, Chuck. In a sense, everything we do on the Internet is a form of communications because somebody, one way or another, wants to speak to somebody else. Now, in some cases, the speech might take the form of electronic mail, which might be very much a personal one-to-one -one kind of a communication. Or on the other end of the spectrum, we might have somebody writing a scholarly journal article that they're putting up on an electronic journal somewhere on the net. 
Tonight I want to tease out sort of the difference between person-to-person -person communications, perhaps of a more informal nature, and things that are more along the lines of publishing on the internet. Okay? So if we look at this first slide, we'll see that electronic mail is but one example of the kinds of communications that take place on the net. Flowing from the idea of one-to-one -one or one-to-a-few email is the concept of a mailing list. And we'll talk about how you use your familiar electronic mail mailbox to plug into a mailing list. Now, there's a similar concept for group communications known as Usenet. And we'll see some examples of what Usenet is all about. There are various examples of real-time communications on the internet. Internet Relay Chat, or IRC, is one of those. And that's sort of a text mode way that people can talk back and forth using their keyboards. And there are some real-time communication schemes that move us into sort of video phone-like applications. Tonight, we won't be spending much time on real-time communications, but rather we'll be talking about the other more traditional forms. Now, when we get into publishing, we're getting into ways that people can put up documents on the internet for retrieval on demand by whoever might come along. So the audience might consist of a diverse group of people. It might be very small, one or two, 10 or 12. It might be hundreds or thousands or millions, and you don't even necessarily know. But the whole philosophy here of publishing on the internet is you put some sort of an electronic document online, and you expect that your audience is going to come to you. They're going to come to your server and on their demand decide when they want to read things. Some of the different media that we use on the internet for publishing include the Internet Gopher, which was quite popular for the first couple of years after its inception, and the World Wide Web, which since uh, March or April of 1993, when Mosaic came out, has really um, swept over the inter internet landscape in terms of publishing. There is another kind of a system called Waze, or Wide Area Information Servers, which um, really doesn't get a lot of discussion these days. And the reason is, it's kind of a neat idea, but for a number of reasons, people don't actually use Waze very much. But it's a part of the landscape, and I thought it was important to mention it. There are some other kinds of schemes out there that people also don't talk about very much. One example might be an email server. And that's a facility where you'd put a document online, and somebody can come along and send the command via email that says, send me this document, please. Or another arena might be anonymous FTP, one of the old tried and true mechanisms for publishing information on the internet. But the basic distinction here, again, is with publishing, we're putting up some sort of a document for people to pull off the internet when they feel like it. With communications, we're sending a message out to an individual or to a group, which we hope that they will read when it arrives in their mailbox or whatever other avenue it might be. Electronic mail, as we've said, is pretty much a one-to-one -one or a one-to-a-few kind of a, me a medium. Now, one thing that's interesting about internet email is that your environment may be dramatically different than your correspondence environment. You might be on a corporate network or a university network or on one of the mass market utilities like America Online, CompuServe, or Prodigy, or you might be on our service here in East Lansing, TCI Mets. But no matter what kind of a network connection you have and no matter what kind of email package you might be using, you will be able to use the same sorts of concepts to communicate with somebody else on the internet. Here's an example of an email message you might compose on the net. And in general, no matter what package you're using, you'll find headers for your messages that are all pretty standard. When it was composed, who it's from, you type in the subject and you tell it who you want to send it to. And an address might look like wiggins at msu.edu. Then the body of the message is going to be free form. And it's going to be whatever you want to type in for the actual text of the message. Here's some examples of some of the email addresses you might use. And this is fairly intuitive. Uh, we already saw this one. It might be smythe at aol.com if you're on America Online. Or it might be hwiggins at iquest.com. That happens to be my brother's email address. You'll often see specialized email addresses like webmaster at digital.com. And that's the person who takes care of the World Wide Web service at Digital Equipment Corporation. If you want to talk to Bill Clinton, you can send a message to uh, president at whitehouse.gov. And if you want to send a message to us, you could send it to this address, which also shows at the bottom of the screen um, at the end of the show. Now, electronic mail is a way that we can talk to one or a few people. But using our familiar electronic mailbox, we can also plug into a universe called mailing lists. And that's a way that we can say we want to plug into a particular kind of a discussion that's taking place largely on the internet. And we'll often use tools by the name of ListServe or ListProc or similar kinds of terms. 
The neat thing about this is you sit in your email box, you compose some commands that you want to um, use to, to tell the email processor to put you on the list, and from then on, you and your correspondents can talk back and forth. Now, these lists are organized by topic, perhaps. A mailing list might be about photography or Bosnia or whatever subject you can imagine. Or it might be by affinity group, all of the worldwide web masters at Michigan State University, for instance. Now, here's how a mailing list works. Everyone who is interested in a particular subject has told a mailing list processor, I want to subscribe to this mailing list. And then one person can post a message to that processor, like, when is our next meeting? The message will then automatically be sent off to everyone who has indicated they want to be a subscriber to the mailing list. And then any replies will go back to everyone who's a member of the list as well. Now, Usenet News is another big form of communication, and a lot of Usenet News traffic is carried over the Internet. The concept is kind of similar to the mailing list concept in the sense that we have groups of people that want to communicate. But the implementation is quite different. With Usenet News, you tend to use some news reading software, which might be a specialized program, perhaps something called RN or NN or TIN. There's a number of these different programs out there. You also can use Netscape or other web browsers to some extent to navigate Usenet News. Now, Usenet consists of several thousand news groups that are organized by topic. And what you can do with Usenet is you can have a much more fleeting approach to various Usenet news groups. You can decide one day, you know, I really want to read the Intel news group and spend a lot of time in it for day after day. And then you can just decide, I don't want to read that group anymore. And you simply stop pointing your news reading software at that particular news group when you don't want to read anything out of uh, that particular arena any further. Most of the content of Usenet is conversational, but Usenet is also used as a way to distribute software, images, and even sounds over the Internet. And if you have really fancy news reading software, it'll make it easy for you to decode these multimedia files that are sent over Usenet. Okay? Here's an example of a posting to Usenet News. Now, I said that these groups are organized into uh, specific topic areas, and it's more or less a hierarchy. Sci.math.research, for instance, is a place where mathematicians hang out and talk to one another. And in this particular case, we have a mathematician who is um, at Concordia University in Montreal, and he's learned that a particular theorem has been proven at a conference, and he wants to get word out to mathematicians worldwide. So with Usenet, you have these feeds of information that are carried from site to site. And a particular site, like Michigan State University, says, you know, we want to participate in Usenet. So they set up a news server. And then every user on the campus can invoke a news reader that has been configured to talk to that server and can read whatever news they want whenever they want. It's like turning on the TV and pressing the old clicker to switch among channels. Okay? So the news groups that you're interested in, the contents of those groups will be transmitted off to your workstation under your command. Here's some examples of some of the Usenet news groups that you'll run into. Rec.photo, photography. Rec.crafts.textiles.quilting, pretty obvious. Comp.sys.intel, a lot of the discussion that had to do with the Pentium flaw took place on this news group. Um, and these last couple, Alt Fan Newt Gingrich, we can guess what that might be. And Alt Internet Access Wanted. If you're looking for a good internet service provider, let's say you're not happy the one, with the one that you currently have. So that gives you a flavor for the different arenas in which we can communicate on the internet. Now let's talk a little bit more about publishing on the internet. Again, we've said when you want to publish on the net, you want to put some sort of a document or a resource online for people to plug into when they choose to. And you intend for that document or resource to be available more or less permanently. Now, your readers have different situations where they'll seek your document. A reader might say, where is IBM's homepage? And they'll go and use various mechanisms and strategies for going and finding that homepage. Or they might stumble upon your document using a search tool. They might say, I'm looking for all the home pages that have to do with zoology or photography or what have you. In this example, we're saying, show me all the home pages that have McGraw-Hill in the title. Or they may just completely stumble upon your document by, while they're doing some surfing. They may find somebody else on the internet that found your document interesting and therefore put in a pointer to your document, and then the user can click and eventually find your way. Once you've found your way, you may land on the internet shopping network, and now once you've gotten there, you want to know does the ISN offer us cubic zirconia over the internet? The media for the internet 
are quite varied. We've already gone over some of these. It varies from anonymous FTP to email servers to the Internet Gopher. Now, this is still a very viable tool for publishing on the Internet, but it is text-oriented, and we don't have a lot of fancy fonts or anything, and it's really falling out of favor with a lot of Internet publishers. The World Wide Web seems to be where a lot of the action is. People want to get their home page up on the net, as we saw in the examples earlier in this program from the Wall Street Journal. Even Usenet can serve as a publishing medium in some ways. There are certain Usenet news groups that have been set up so that um, they are intended only to carry content um, that people want to look at periodically. And we'll talk about a couple of examples of those. Now, typically, when you are publishing on the internet, you have a server that is directly connected to the internet full time. Now, your user might have a full time connection, like over TCI METS, or they might have a dial up connection. That doesn't really matter. But when you get in the game of publishing, when you want to put a document up on the World Wide Web, you're going to have to put it onto a server that is directly connected in most cases. That doesn't mean you have to own the server. Somebody else somewhere in your community or somewhere else on the internet might rent space to you from their server. So you don't have to run the server in your office or in your basement in order to publish on the internet. You do have to find a server that is directly connected that will host your pages for you. Talking about Usenet as a publishing medium, some of the news groups that are known for their periodic postings will host files that are known as FAQ documents, or frequently asked question files. Now, these may be compiled by one or a group of people. And these FAQs tend to be very topic specific. For instance, the FAQ for Alt Binaries Pictures tells people about the various for file formats that they will encounter on the internet. A couple of news groups of interest News.Answers is an archive of FAQs that people might want to look at. And there are a variety of news groups that begin with comp.sources that actually have source code for software that you can find on the internet. One final point about all of this is that the publishing media that are on the internet could be described as massively diverse. And by that I mean whenever you hear somebody complaining that the internet is too much one way or another, there's too much trash on the internet, there's too much pornography on the internet, Whatever the complaint is, that's like walking into a, a town and saying there's too much trash in this town. You have to go to the specific areas where you will find the good stuff before you can denounce the entire internet. And on this version of my graphic here, just drawn to scale more or less, I've got two little red splotches here. And these are the little red splotches representing um, perhaps salacious or pornographic material you might find on the internet. All of Usenet is much bigger than the dirty stuff. And the World Wide Web is much, much bigger than whatever small amount of dirty stuff you might find there. And all of the internet is much, much, much bigger than those areas as well. So that should give you an overview of communications versus publications on the internet. Thanks, Rich. Um, as, I was, as, as I was watching that and listening to that, I was sort of kind of thinking to myself, if, if I woke up tomorrow and the, the internet were all gone, everything was gone, what thing would I miss the most? And I'll, oh, I'll let you answer, question. I'll answer, think about it for a second. I'll tell you what it would be uh, that I'd miss the most. It'd be electronic mail. I mean, surfing the web is great and publishing is great, but the thing that I use the internet for, and I count 20 to 30 times a day sometimes, is communicating with people. I use it, I, I couldn't live without electronic mail. I mean, what about you? I think at this point I'd still have to say electronic mail. That's the first thing people use, and that's what you use the most, and it's part of doing your business. I'd have to yeah, agree. It's sort of traditional, and it's... Uh, it's a strong part of uh, what the Internet's all about. So I thought that, think that's a good segment. Uh, let's get on to the next segment. Okay. Well, tonight we're going to see Rich's first Chuck and Rich on the Road segment. Rich went to the Café Electronique in Montreal, Canada. So, the most important thing is, did you bring me anything back from Montreal, Canada, Rich? Well, Chuck, yes, as a matter of fact, I did bring you something back, but I want to point something out here. Okay. We've had several Chuck and Rich on the Road segments, and, and you've done them heretofore, but I've been giving you stuff. So it seems to me now it's, it's getting to be your turn. It's certainly a three to nothing, but I'm going to catch up in the next show, I promise. Okay, I promise. good deal. Well, on that promise, I'll go ahead and give you one more gift. Okay. 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 Um, I was at a library conference in Montreal, the Special Libraries Association, and they get, have little goodies they give out in the booths there. And I found a handkerchief or a scarf that has a World Wide Web address on it. Well, that's and pretty so neat. I claim, Chuck, this is the first article that you could carry around in your pocket and uh, 
perhaps wear, wear around your neck um, with a URL located. Well, it see, seems with all this, all this network stuff on scarfing, maybe we ought to have a new segment called Scarfing the Net, so we're, we're scrounging around. But this oh. is, but, <laughs> sorry. Now, this, uh, this reminds me. What rhymes me. with scarfing, Chuck? Never mind. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, tell us about your segment. Well, I'm walking along the streets of old Montreal, and I find um, Le Café Electronique, which I had heard about, and I hadn't really planned on going there. And I said, well, heck, since we got them in um, Café Renaissance, we did the same sort of a theme. We got to get these people on, on tape. Next thing they knew, there I am with the camcorder out and assaulting them. So let's see what Le Café Electronique is all about. Hi, Chuck. Greetings from Montreal. I'm at Le Café Electronique. Old Montreal is known for its boutiques and sidewalk cafes. There you'll also find Le Café Electronique, Montreal's first establishment offering coffee, sandwiches, and internet access. Hello, I'm a university student, and I'm mad about the com computers and the internet, and I've always wanted to work in an electronic cafe. So I called these people up one day, and they said, well, we're too busy with that for now, but come and work at a multimedia international marketplace. So I did that, and eventually I worked my way over to here. What we have here... And how long ago was this? This was about three months ago. And when did this place open? This place only opened about three and a half weeks ago. Uh -huh. So in the meantime, I've done lifting and moving and other things. Well, ici, je suis animateur, c'est-à-dire I am a counselor uh, and I help people to use internet and browse the web. Okay? With uh, and we use uh, three, between three and five minutes to uh, open the sessions with the people who want to uh, know how we uh, can, what, what we can do uh, on the net, uh -huh. what we can find to, what we can get, reach, or uh, What's your the favorite world. search engine on the web? Oh, I uh, am interested to use how the, the engines. Oh, do you like uh, like but, us? Yes, I like Sorry. like us. Uh, and uh, info seek it's a good one too. Who? Info seek Oh yes. Netscape yes. communication. Yes. Uh -huh. We charge money for a half hour. Yeah, Unfortunately, we charge five dollars Canadian plus tax. Always have tax for a half hour. It's the same price for the CD-ROMs as well. And uh, and so this little box here. A little red, little black box. The red, the red light comes on. It means that the keyboard and the mouse have been disconnected, and that lets the person know they're they're done. The virtual tourist world map is popular because it allows people to graphically have an idea of where they're going. Often it's very confusing to be around the world and not even realize that you're going to another country across the seas. At the virtual tourist, they give you a map, you click, there we go, take a while for it to come up, you click on a region of the map that you're interested in seeing. Mm -hmm. And from there it's as if you're zooming in at high speed down on the earth and eventually you get to the individual web service and you never know what you might find. Most people go for Europe, I find, in our cafe. They already know what North America is like because they live here. But being in Quebec, we get a lot of French people who are interested in, in France or other European countries. People are coming downtown when it's a little bit cooler to look at old Montreal. It's a very beautiful spot here, uh, especially on weekends you get uh, actually tour buses coming through. Mm -hmm. They come, you, you might have seen uh, horse-drawn carriages outside, mm -hmm. there's the old port, all sorts of uh, attractions. What we're hoping to do in the future is have uh, a storage of mail facility. So, for instance, if someone is coming from Europe to Canada, they can have their friend send mail to this address, and then when they pass through Montreal, they can come in and say, hello, my name is so has anyone any mail arrived for me? A cafe network would be, would be a very fun idea. Uh, essentially, people are coming into the cafe and often they say, so I, I want to talk to somebody. And one of the things they don't realize is, well, somebody has to be at the other end waiting for them to talk. But a cafe network means there's always people coming in looking for someone to talk to while they're having their coffee. Um, other than that, having a large screen, I, I don't know, it's a bit private. I remember one person was a little bit uh, embarrassed when suddenly the timer clicked off, they could no longer use the mouse of the keyboard and they were stuck on the adult entertainment home page with a sexy picture on it. We kindly came over and returned our page back home. 
And the idea of the cafe is in part to provide some funding for the exhibition which goes on next door. The exhibition changes every year. We'll have new exhibitions next year. Uh, the cafe, however, is, is open permanently. How do you say in French, I like to surf the internet? OK. OK. Bon, je veux dire en français ce que j'aime. C'est j'aime naviguer sur Internet. That's it. It sounds pretty cool in French. <laughs> So Chuck, how do you think that compares to the Café Renaissance in San Diego? Well, it's, it's real clear that they're very serious about putting some significant computer resources integrated into their café, and that's, that's a, certainly a different approach, and it's, uh, it's neat. Both, both, both approaches are neat. So, Well, our next segment tonight is going to be Tech Talk, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the technology we use here in the studio. In today's Tech Talk segment, Chuck is going to tell us about ChannelWorks technology. This is a technology we're using here as we show you how to surf the internet, and it's being used by TCI in the mid-Michigan area to service homes that, and businesses that want to connect to the internet over high-speed connections. Chuck? Thanks, Rich. Well, I have to congratulate myself at least waiting four shows before I nerd out on the technology that we're using for the show. So I'm kind of excited about talking about this because it's really neat stuff that we're using here. The heart of the system that we're using is a modem called the ChannelWorks modem from Digital Equipment Corporation. And uh, basically there's this box here that's sitting in front of me. It's a Digital ChannelWorks is the name of it. And what this is, is it's a modem. And like any other modem, like your 2400, your 2800 baud modem, the purpose of a modem is to take a digital signal from a computer and turn it into an analog signal to go over a phone line, or in this case, a cable television channel. Now what happens is this modem is actually a small television station in your house. The connection to the back of it <clears throat> connects one side to the cable network. So if we look here, we have a connection, and that connection looks exactly like the connection that you'll find on a VCR or a television system, and you plug in basically the same cable TV that would also go to your VCR and your television system. In addition, it also has a digital side to it. This is the analog side, and what you do is you connect up a local area network, and in this case, we're going to use an Ethernet network, which is a very, very popular local area network, and you can buy an Ethernet adapter for about $30 for most home computers, somewhere between $30 and $80, depending on the kind of computer that you have. So what this is, is this is a digital data network, and it has the standard Ethernet connector that we're familiar with, the BNC connector. So what's happening here is your computer, or set of computers in your home or business, is using digital communications through this part, <coughs> and the cable modem is actually reading the digital communications. And when there's a communication that has to move through the network, it actually transmits it as if it were a small television station up the cable TV network. Data coming down, broadcast from the other channel works boxes on the same channel, is then received by your modem, and the appropriate information is taken from the analog TV signal and converted into digital and moved out across the digital network. So this is a really exciting technology, but it's very difficult. We go from a technology where in typical cable, there's one place that sends data at the head end that sends data out to all people to everybody who has one of these channel works box effectively is running a small television station. And these television stations have to keep out of each other's way and there's a complicated protocol that works between them. So it's a very exciting technology and there's a lot of challenges in it, but we're very excited. It's been here for over a year in East Lansing. It's in production. There are a number of businesses in this town that use this every day. So I'm very excited. I want to show you now on the computer a little bit of detail about our connection between the studio and the internet. So in the studio, in red here, what I have is I have the cable TV, that's the coax cable TV, carrying the analog signals. And at each point that we have some data moving back and forth, we have a channel works cable modem. And that's what these little uh, blue boxes are, is cable modems. And then in black, we have the lines that are actually the digital communications. And so that right there might be in the corner, that might be our system here in the studio. And we have, there's also a server in the studio. In addition, the cable goes out to great, Greater Lansing area homes and businesses, and the data is also shared there. Now to get onto the internet, 
The cable is extended onto the Michigan State University campus, and a 10 megabit Ethernet local area network then dumps the, the data onto Michigan State's fiber optic ba backbone, which then connects to the internet. So for our data to move back and forth between Michigan State University and the internet and TCI, it comes across the internet in digital form, it gets sent across fiber optic, it gets sent across a local area network in digital form, it essentially is broadcast by a small television station inside of this box across the coax cable, which is then received by the similar box inside of our studio and then transmitted back into digital information. And so that's the kind of equipment that we've been using and what it's taken for this, uh, to get this data back and forth. And of course, it all moves very fast and very reliably. And I think it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun here to uh, use this. Excellent explanation, Chuck. You only made one mistake, though. You said it's the first time you've nerded out in Tech Talk. Oh, I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Touche. Good presentation. Thanks. Let's see what's happening in the Internet news. First off, Microsoft has planned its Microsoft network to have an Internet-friendly aspect. They say that the network's going to be fully integrated with the Internet. Uh, the World Wide Web will be an important part of the Microsoft network. Now, at first, only users in the U.S. who are connecting to Microsoft network will have full Internet access, but eventually, users worldwide are expected to have full Internet access. The Microsoft network will be available as an icon that's selectable under Windows 95. So you click on an icon and you're connected to the Internet. Other online utilities, such as America Online and CompuServe, have let people know that they are objecting to this. And the Justice Department is looking into this policy um, to see if it violates antitrust provisions. TCI Cable has issued a request for proposals for a cable modem vendor. The TCI Technical Ventures Unit has issued a 50-page request, and Stephen Dukes, the Vice President of Technology, says staff has been researching the requirements for this RFP for several months. TCI expects that they'll have a commercial product in place by early 1996. Carnegie Mellon University has announced they're going to review the pornography study that's gotten so much attention lately. The study was conducted by an undergraduate at Carnegie Mellon who has since moved on, and that study featured prominently in Time Magazine's cover story about cyber porn on the Internet. In the study, they compiled data on Internet usage patterns without obtaining permission of the CMU participants in the study, and this has raised concerns among the faculty and staff and student body at Carnegie Mellon. Elsewhere, numerous critics have found flaws in the methodology used in this particular study. Two companies, CyberCash and CheckFree, have announced a partnership that has to do with the Internet. CyberCash is going to work with CheckFree to develop their own secure system for online transactions. Now, CheckFree has a system that's used by a quarter of a million users of the Quicken software from Intuit. And CyberCash has been an early entrant in the whole commerce on the Internet marketplace. The University of California at San Francisco has decided that they should put on the internet some papers relating to tobacco companies. These papers allegedly show proof that these companies knew that nicotine was dangerous long before they admitted it publicly. One tobacco company, Brown and Williamson, says that documents that are uh, to be put online were stolen and they've demanded return of that material. The accusation is that those documents were stolen by somebody in the state of Kentucky. AT&T has bought a stake in an internet service provider called BBN Planet. Now, BBN Planet is a service division that was recently set up by a venerable internet technology firm, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. And that unit of BBN has $25 million in annual revenues, and AT&T's stake is $8 million. A study has been conducted that shows that, so far, undergraduates aren't making much use of the World Wide Web. In a poll, the Hannigan Consulting Group found that 98% of undergraduates have some sort of internet access, but 71% of those only use it for email. And in the commerce on the net arena, only 0.3% have actually bought anything over the internet. This was reported in Investor's Business Daily. Vint Cerf, the inventor of IP and an important person in terms of technology on the internet, has been asked recently, what were the first words that were transmitted over the Internet? 
And his response is, I wish I could remember. He's afraid that the, the uh, actual first transmission was something like, this is a test. And his comment is that engineers most of the time are not poets. So we didn't get something like, come here, Watson, I need you. And that's today's Net News. In the internet interview today, Rich interviews Vern Ehlers, a U.S. congressman from the Grand Rapids area. He's a been a professor of physics in his past lives, and he's been acutely involved in many of the technology issues in the U.S. Congress. And he's largely responsible for getting the U.S. Congress up on the World Wide Web. Thank you, Congressman Ehlers, for taking time to speak with us this morning. I'm happy to be here. Um, what did you think when you saw some examples of high-speed internet access, like voice and weather downloading? Well, I, th I think it's tremendous. You know, much of the emphasis of the past decade on computers has been making them faster, uh, able to do more operations. Unfortunately, often the complexity of the programs has meant that uh, the end result isn't any faster. But when I compare what I see in my computer today with what I had in my very first computer, it's just no comparison. And it's high time that communications technology caught up with that. And instead of sitting there at your computer waiting 20 minutes for something to download uh, over the telephone line, it's much better to have a big, bigger bandwidth and fast transfer rates. And I, you know, that's the direction everything's going to go. And I hope someday we'll have fiber optic into every house, mm -hmm. not just coax. Congressman, in Canada, there's a partnership between Industry Canada and the provincial governments with a goal to get every school and library in the country connected to the internet within three years. Similarly, in Michigan, Governor Engler has announced a program to also connect every school and library. What do you see as the role of the federal government in trying to achieve this same goal throughout the United States? I think the federal government should do everything it can to encourage the internet. I, I uh, applaud the governor and the Canadians for doing what they're doing. But I'm, I get a little nervous about the federal government doing too much at the local level. I think we should have uh, organizations at the local level, such as uh, in Grand Rapids, we have FreeNet and GrandNet, both getting their, their feet on the ground. It'd be great to see that everywhere locally, and then on a statewide basis, have a statewide policy that, uh, that ensures connectivity. But the important thing is to try to make provision for every student, every citizen, to have access to the internet in order to get the information that they need. And whether it's from their home, or whether they go down to the library to do it or the kids do it in school, everyone should have access to that information. How important do you feel the quality of a nation's information infrastructure is to its global competitiveness? I, I think you can't be competitive globally without being uh, connected these days. And it's even bigger than that because, in a sense, it's beyond competition. It's cooperation. Mm. Uh, corporations have engineers in the United States, may have a plant in Singapore, and they may have consultants in Germany, and all of these people have to be uh, in, interconnected and communicating back and forth all the time. And I, I think that, that's just the way the world's going to operate. How can we foster the free flow of information on the internet while giving parents the ability to protect their children from objectionable or otherwise unsavory material? That, that's a very difficult question. I certainly uh, sympathize with those who want to protect kids from it. Uh, I think the real problem is the garbage that people put on the Internet, and that says something about our society and the people that are in it. Uh, that stuff simply shouldn't be there. Why, why do we have to uh, consume valuable resources of storage, communication, and so forth for that kind of smut? Uh, if, if people want to live that kind of life, I suppose that's that's their choice, but they don't have to clutter up uh, the common property with that. So it, it is a problem, however, because people do it, and I think uh, we should discourage, discourage that as much as we can and certainly prevent the kids from seeing it. Do you support the Exxon bill, or do you support something like parental advisories? No, I don't think parental advisories do much good because the kids are operating computers without their parents. Uh, quite frequently, the kids know more than the parents. And so you need more than an advisory. I, uh, I'm not particularly happy with the Exxon bill. I think that's an unworkable approach. Um, again, the basic problem is what the people themselves are doing, and we have to try to get at that and just communicate some sort of 
uh, code of c civility or virtue that says, hey, you know, that's stuff you don't put out on the net for everyone to see. But there does, unfortunately, have to be some policing. I'm particularly concerned about the, uh, the, the, uh, the pedophiles and others who are using the net to try to locate victims, and that's, that's particularly dangerous. Uh, it, it requires some supervision. But it would be nice if we could do as we hope to do with the TV, just have some sort of chip installed that uh, parents can say, OK, anything that's uh, questionable is not accessible to my child. And you can, it doesn't even, ha even have to be a chip. It can be a password control, too. Mm -hmm. Some people complain that when the government compiles information and then charges for access to that same information over the Internet, the taxpayer ends up paying twice. How do you feel about that? I think that's fine, and I think the government should do it, but often the government's constrained by its budget and can't do it as efficiently, and uh, often doesn't even have the money to get it out there. Uh, when I was uh, in the Michigan legislature, I sponsored a bill dealing with geographic information systems, and the approach I took in that is that the local units of government which compiled the geographic uh, information would be allowed to charge for that information when it's used by a private sector company and, and uh, spread throughout the entire economy. And I think that's the approach the federal government could take, too. I, I proposed that last week because the, the NOAA budget for weather forecasting is being cut, and they don't know how they can provide the service. I said, well, why not charge for the radar data, for the satellite data that you now provide free to every TV station? Uh, TV stations put a tremendous amount of money into the weather forecasting, and yet uh, everything they get from the federal government is free. Uh, why not charge them a modest amount to uh, pay for the cost of collecting the data? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the approach that the government should take in the future. One more question. What is your favorite home page on the World Wide Web? Uh, mine, of course. <laughs> What's your second favorite home page? <laughs> I, I, I'll have to be honest with you. I do not have time to surf the internet. I put in about 90 or 100 hours a week in my job as a congressman. And so I only use it for the things I have to know. And I just don't have time to, to, to look at them. I have to tell you the best one that I've seen is the one that you showed me downstairs a few, a few moments ago and uh, the work that MSU is doing well, and that you. you're doing. Thank you. And uh, I think you've done a tremendous job. Well, thank you much. Good. And thank you for your time. Thank you. One thing that was somewhat refreshing about talking with Congressman Ehlers was we sat him down in TCI's regional offices here in East Lansing, and we sat him down in a workstation connected to the web over Channel Works, and he said, huh, this looks like a home page to me. Grabbed the mouse and started surfing. And you may not agree with all of the points that the congressman makes, but it's nice to talk to somebody who's up on technology and knows how to navigate. Right. I, I, uh, I, Rich, I think that when he was talking about his page, I think he was actually talking about the Thomas page for the, for the U.S. government. I think that's the one he's talking about. But I think it is really important that uh, the people that make the important decisions for this country make those decisions with a full understanding of exactly what the Internet is, both its strengths and its weaknesses. There's a lot of people that want to run legislation and, blah, 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 and only talk about the weaknesses, but someone needs to know about both sides of the Internet. Absolutely. So. Now it's time to do a little bit of surfing. We're going to start off with the Thomas service of the Library of Congress. Let's see what it looks like. And this is a really interesting. It, it, unlike a lot of them, which are sort of brochures that might actually be like a tour, tour guide, this seems to be very practical. And I, I imagine they may use this in their in their day-to-day -day activities. Congress produces a great deal of information that a number of people are very interested in. And the interesting thing about this is they have the full text of legislation, both the House and Senate bills. I mean, a person could learn a great deal about uh, taking a look at what's going on. And one of the things that they've got is they've got the capability to search by keywords in bills. So let's cruise down here. And what we do is this is a search uh, search capability that's going to search these bills for particular keywords. And I'm going to search for uh, one of our favorite topics, Internet. Okay. So let's search for recent bills, and I'll do run query. We'll search for rec recent bills uh, about Internet. And according to our search here, we have 23 items retrieved. 
<coughs> that have the word internet somewhere in the text of the bill. So here we have the very various things. And here, something that you were just talking about, requiring that something, some kind of information, is going to be made available to the public on the, on the internet. So let's okay, I think we're actually in the previous Congress, not yes, the current one. Yeah. So yeah. this would be when that legislation was introduced. So here we go. Now, what we can do here is this is a, a, actually cross-references that we could take oh. a look at. But let's actually pull down the bill. So if we system. selected those cross-references, we could look at the debate that went on. Perhaps, yes, or, or re related things. So here we have the text, June 23, 1994. Hey, look here. Look who introduced this legislation. Ah, uh -huh, Congressman Ehlers. Exactly, exactly. Let's, so let's take a look at uh, one thing that you can do once you actually have the text of this is you can take a look for words. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a local search of this document that the document's been downloaded to our system. So I'm going to just look, look for the word internet and see how many times it shows up. Oop. If I type it right, internet. Okay, so I'll move this out of the way. So now I can search and find the word internet in a document. And every time I hit next, okay, so those are the two mm -hmm. references for the word internet in a document. So I think this is a real exciting thing, and it certainly allows us as the public to have access to a great deal of information. Now, this was an example of the, the subject I was raising with the congressman in the interview, and that is um, this is freely available on the internet, and anybody can come along as long as they have internet access and plug in and look at this stuff. Right. I think that's far preferable to a system where you have to get onto some particular online service and pay a fee to look at the bills. I mean, it's our Congress, so we should be able to look at the bills freely. One of the sites that uh, I saw pop up in the last month was the, the Detroit News. And uh, this is a really nice site. I, I think that graphically, sometimes sites overdo things with, uh, with their tables and pictures mm -hmm. and images. But, uh, and, and they use all these fancy Netscape extensions to do all kinds of things. But this page, to me, uses these, all these nice extensions, these graphical extensions, to really create what seems like an online newspaper. So all these lines, and it looks very nice to me. What now, by the way, my, I, I do like it. I think it's very attractive. They've done a nice job. Um, I will point out that my buddies at Nando have a look and feel that's pretty similar, the Raleigh News and Observer. And um, I agree with you in general that the presentation is very nice. They've done a nice job. But this tabular display you, s you see here is, in fact, recent Netscape e extensions. Right. The, the interesting thing is it used to be that us computer nerds were the only ones that you know, some new feature would come out and we'd all try it out and play with it. You know, the professionals now, as they're getting in and doing professional marketing, they're really taking advantage of some yeah. of these things. So let's take a, a look at uh, sports. I heard about this uh, in the British Open where, where uh, somebody sank this amazing putt in the wind and the rain at the very end. So. Now, of course, right now the Detroit News and the Detroit Free Press Agency are, are on strike. So this newspaper online is a supplement to the rather slimmed down edition that they're able to get out. Um, using editors and managerial staff to produce a print newspaper. Yeah, so there we go. I think that means that he sank the putt there. He's a happy man. So let's go back. Now the interesting thing that, that uh, came out about two days after the Detroit News was up, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I could tell, was this thing called the Detroit Journal. I think this is really interesting. What, what tell us about this, Rich? Well, because the newspapers are on strike, the reporters of uh, the paper that aren't producing either the online version or the uh, limited print edition have put up an online web newspaper of their own. So this is sort of a counter newspaper. This is their response um, to what's up on the web. Um, on the web. So let's take a look at some of their editorials. I imagine they'll have some choice words here. Right, and and, and this is really interesting because, you know, for perhaps the first time, both sides have equal access to us. Both sides can show their views. You'd think in a newspaper strike, in the old days, the, the, per, the, the owners of the newspaper would have the right to put their views out in their media. But if we're web, everybody's equal. I can look at the striking perspective, or I can look at the management perspective. And of course, uh, I think that's really interesting. So here there, here's the strikers uh -huh. talking about the damage from the newspaper dispute may be irreparable. Actually, as it turns out, in San Francisco several months ago, or maybe a year ago now, when the Chronicle was on strike, the same sort of thing played out. The newspaper put up their edition on the web, and then the striking journalists put up their own newspaper. 
So I think this is pretty neat. They got their columnists, news stories, entertainment. And, uh, what you want to bet they're not using the same internet service provider or web publishing firm. <laughs> that wouldn't be surprising. Uh, okay. Those bits are probably a few miles away from each other. So next, next I want to talk. Uh, jump to uh, one of the topics that you talked about in your net news segment about this uh, this uh, Carnegie Mellon University study. What tell us yeah, what, about this one? One of the nice things about the net is that among all the noise, we do have opportunities for people to go to the actual source documents. So rather than reading Time Magazine's interpretation of Marty Rim's study or somebody else's interpretation, you can go and you can look at the actual full text of the study and evaluate it yourself. And then this is at Georgetown University Law School that they put it online. They've also put some commentary by a few of the uh, sort of prominent folks that might also have their own opinions. So you can compare their opinions with the actual study. And I imagine a lot of the folks criticizing the study have taken advantage of this use the internet to pull it down and look it over and see what they think about the methodology. Uh, the major complaint is that this would not pass muster in any scholarly journal. It's not peer review quality in terms of the methodology that they used. Right. And again, the internet providing both sides of the issue, we'll take a look at um, sort of the rebuttal. I call it the rebuttal. Yeah, this is where several um, folks who are involved in sort of the demography and the statistics of the internet have looked at the study and they've said that really um, the study seems to confuse several factors. They seem to confuse online dial-up BBS's with the internet and they seem to confuse a small part of Usenet with the entire internet and these are fairly fatal flaws in the way the person is analyzing the internet. And The bad news there is it scares people away. They say I don't want any of this internet stuff because it's full of pornography. Um, where you've got to put things in perspective and get the right, the right balance on what's out there. Um, one thing that I would note is that you don't have to, as we're doing this surfing, follow every single URL. Don't sit there with your pencil and your paper. All you need to know is the show URL. Every single show has a separate directory on our server. And what I do is I keep the URLs. I'm actually doing the surfing right from the show page. So if you know the show URL, you don't have to remember any of the URLs that we're going to be using. You can simply access them directly from the home page. Well, Chuck, I'm amazed you told these people that. I thought it was like a cooking show, and we had everyone you know, with their Netscape lined up, and they were all surfing along in sync. Well, that's not a bad idea. If we get enough viewers, that could be some serious harm for the uh, throughput of the Internet. One, one interesting anecdote that I, I heard, and I don't know exactly what show it was on, but uh, someone was doing an email demonstration on uh, one of the morning shows, uh, and basically what they did is they made the mistake of uh, putting their email address and by uh -huh. the end of the show all these mail messages started coming in. So well our address is out there and we want you to send us some mail, okay? So we'll, uh, we'll uh, see you on the net. <laughs>